So Elizabeth's reign is off to a rousing start. Uh, she is condemned like me. I have to ask myself the question. When I read this in books, I mean, there's a lot of this stuff. She's condemned by the Catholic Church like, what else do you expect? Uh, she's the daughter of Anne Boleyn. She's considered illegitimate. Uh, as, as a child, she's considered illegitimate and a total freaking heretic because she was Protestant. I don't think anybody, I mean, that was really a statement that I can't imagine that any pope in his right mind would have made because nobody really knows what Elizabeth was up until that time. She was raised by, you know, had a Protestant mother who was bumped off very early. Uh, and raised in the court of Henry. She wasn't raised, necessarily raised a Catholic, but she uh, typically, who, who was training her? She wasn't trained by Calvinist ministers or anything else. So we don't really know what her, what her internal beliefs were. But eventually what happens is she is faced with a, uh, basically a, almost a preemptive attack by the Catholic Church against her before she ever comes to power. And she's right away on the defensive and also right away uh, try to find a middle ground between the extremism of, of let's say, Edward VI, who uh, killed a number of Catholics, and then Bloody Mary killed a number of Protestants. And <coughs> we, we've, got, we've got to get away from this. So out of this, this I, I'd say, uh, <coughs> this position of being caught in the middle, being under attack by the Catholic Church, the Protestants don't go after her. They don't attack her for anything in particular. So it leaves her leaning in that direction, and so what she comes up with is for, I'd say the, the remainder of her reign, which is going to be until 163, it's a long reign. 1558 to 163 is a long time. Uh, a long time to bring about change, it's a long time to bring about, I'd say, a, a certain ethos of your reign that's going to really have an impact and so she sets off with the Elizabethan Compromise, which we talked about just briefly. Now, does anybody remember what we talked about in regards to that? What, what is unique about the Elizabethan? Just give me a rundown of this. Yeah, one point, I'll take, okay, you, and then you, and then you, okay. So one of the things is she will not persecute her subjects for their personal beliefs. Okay, how does she know? As, as long as you publicly follow the state church, right? Correct. Yeah. So you can do whatever you want in private, right? But publicly, right? Publicly. You can believe what you want in private. Yeah. You, you won't be examined for co your conscience' sake. There's going to be no inquisition. There's going to be no torture. Uh, <coughs> none of that. Senor. No, that's not what I was going to say. Oh, well, say something else. There's more. <laughs> okay. Uh, she okay. said she's yeah. not the head of the church, but the president of the church. Right. It's a good, good point. What does that mean? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. That's right. <laughs> this is already w working very well. Well, Jonathan. All right. Can I ask you? Was the implication? No, I'm asking the questions. Now. No, I'm sorry. No, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> Guy yeah. takes me seriously. Don't, don't yeah. never do that. Uh, uh, was it, were the implications of being able to worship and believe as you were inside your own self or at home? Um, was that an unwritten implication? Was that not very well said? Though it was. It seemed to be direction? something. It was a growing issue, especially for Catholics. Uh, I think from the film that we saw last week. Uh, showing where priests were hidden in uh, basements <coughs> or in uh, rooms that were sealed off and were hidden away so nobody could find them. People were doing, practicing their Catholicism in secret and bringing on a, a real priest from somewhere in Europe. Uh, and so um, this was something that was becoming a growing issue. Uh, the question is, uh, what, it, at some point, um, the Catholic Church, I mean, the Catholic Church went through tremendous change very fast uh, under Henry. And it had been the church, it had been the church 
and suddenly within within one reign, the reign of Henry, it's suddenly an underground church because they're already uh, they've already protested against Henry's execution of Sir Thomas More, uh, his beheading of Anne Boleyn, uh, <coughs> he is his denunciation of the Pope as the head of the church, that he is the head of the church in England, and so forth. Uh, suddenly this church, this church is going through, it's reeling from blows that it had never encountered before. And Henry's a dangerous guy to, to protest. So you have the, the, the movement of a, a sort of an underground Catholic church movement going on. Uh, it's going to become more of, of an underground Catholic church within a generation after the reign of Edward VI because Edward VI becomes, uh, is the, uh, uh, the ruler who allows Archbishop Cranmer to institute the theological changes that separates the Church of England from the Church in Rome. It's not just any longer a political change, it's a theological change as well. So all of that leads to the fact that if you're going to have, if you're going to try to find a certain, Catholic Church is very dependent upon its priesthood for services. It's the priest who says the words who brings about the uh, the means of grace for the church. All of your uh, every, all the rites that you go through from the time of baptism uh, or marriage, communion, later a death, extreme unction, or ordination. Uh, confirmation, all these things are sacraments that are that give give you points toward a good ending. Let's put it that way. Okay. A favorable ending. Uh, less years in purgatory and so forth. I mean there's a lot of <laughs> lot, but a lot of issues here. I mean I, I, I swear to I mean I really I'm so I'm just so glad I don't live in that period. Because I think it's a very fearful time. But the priest is essential. You can, there is no such thing or, or what I would call lay priests or let's say somebody that, that comes out of the ranks of no training and so forth. For them to, to take over and try to handle some of these things, it's, it's impossible. So, uh, because they don't have, they don't have, they're, they're not ordained to do it, okay? So they're going to import, they're going to import the priesthood from outside down. There are very few English priests around. Most of them are going to be either Spanish or Italian. So when these priests come some, there's come some risk. She's issued the Elizabethan Compromise, which is a very big thing. It will not question you for conscience sake. As long as you go to the Anglican Church and serve that purpose. Outwardly, you're an Anglican, nobody knows the difference. You know, it's like, it reminded, it reminded me of a uh, don't ask, don't tell, which was the policy of the military up, up until, what, two years ago. All right, about on the gay issue, okay. This is the, the church issue, this is the priest issue. We don't, we don't, we're not gonna question you. Just don't say anything, don't, I don't wanna hear it, okay? It's not like, this is Philip of Spain saying, I want, the, I want the, you know, the guts tortured out of you so I, can, I know that you are, you know, we can seize your territory with, and have a good drink afterwards because we know that you're bad news and we took your territory and we did this based on the fact that your your theology is faulty. Well, in England, she doesn't want to hear this. She doesn't want to hear any of this stuff. Don't ask, don't tell, don't broadcast it. I won't torture you for conscience sake. But definitely, you don't strut, you don't walk around and you don't strut around you know, with your little Franciscan suit on or your little Jesuit suit on or anything else. Because you're going to get busted. You're flouting it. But, so the priesthood is basically underground. She wants it to stay that way. She wants the people who are Catholics to remain Catholics. Fine. <coughs> better than that, are you a loyal Englishman? If you're a loyal Englishman, you will go to the, ch the church, the Anglican church, and you will support your queen. You will not let your theological beliefs ever become a reason to try and remove me, to supplant me. 
you will not be a victim of the propaganda of Philip II of Spain, who is always looking for a reason to bump me up. You will not look for a reason to support Mary, Queen of Scots, who lives in England, at my, at my courtesy, she's living here, because she might have a hatch <coughs> again, to bump me off. So you have three different, three different ways in which Elizabeth is under attack. Under attack from the Pope, under attack from Philip II, under attack from Mary, Queen of Scots. And then plus anybody that has a priest, their own private priest, a family that's connected to any of this stuff, could possibly cause trouble, and that's what she's trying to avoid. She's trying to make this as easy and as, I'd say, palatable as possible, and that is, uh, I am showing open tolerance for whatever you believe, just outwardly show yourself that you're an Englishman, first, first of all, and loyal to me. So that becomes a, a big issue, the biggest issue. And was there another question or comment? Somebody else wanted to? Yeah, please. Um, you said that she uh, issued the Elizabethan compliment. <coughs> um, was that, am I to understand We've that? called it, we call it that. Okay, was there an actual document at the time that had all the tenets of No, it? there's no such thing. Uh, at least not that I know of. I suppose that's what I was getting at. Yeah, yeah, there's no document on it, and it's just simply, it's just simply a series of things that add up to this compromise. I'm sorry I didn't make that point, yeah. All right, so, uh, If you didn't attend, if you didn't attend church, what happened? Anybody? Fine. A fine. And anybody on the uh, the nature of the spine? We don't know. We really don't know. Everybody's got a different take on it. Either it's big time, a lot of money. Others say it's just a it's very small, you know, manageable, no no issue. Uh, how did she handle the concept of the mass? Still taking communion. Um, it's not the literal body and blood of Christ, but a trans transgression. We, we don't know what it is. It's uh, transformed. Transform. And it's it's a great word because it doesn't mean anything. It's not the memorial service that the Protestants are thinking that she means, and it's definitely not transubstantiation, which means the change of the elements. We don't know what transform means, and that's just what she was trying to say. I don't want you to know what it means. I want you to be totally confused on this. No, it basically is what she's saying is she wants people to be, read into it whatever they want to. Just stay happy. Uh, don't worry, be happy. And so this is what they're going to So the English kind of go along with this, and they realize that she, they, this is a very good situation. She's managed to stay away from the brutality that's on the continent. Stay away from the kind of brutality that her predecessors administered. And now she's on an even keel. Uh, all she, but she makes it very plain, don't let your religious <coughs> convictions ever transform into uh, a genuine plot against my political authority. Don't screw with me. Period. Don't screw with me. If you do, you'll regret it, and, and some people will regret it. But I have to say, not many. Who, in fact, in the future, continue to to create problems were the Catholics. Uh, Protestants did not create problems for them. Their only problem was for the next 25 years was to urge her to get married and have a kid. A son, preferably, so we don't have to go through this again. But you know, she's not she's not in control of that necessarily. But to get married and have a child, so she, in fact, uh, had, there, there are a number of suitors, and everybody's the, the Protestants are always doing matchmaking, and she lets them do it, but she makes it very plain. Uh, she's not going to marry anybody she's not really truly interested in. And as the time goes on, she's really not going to marry at all. And out of this comes the, the reputation and, and the, the challenging title of the Virgin Queen. Uh, I don't know that you could take that literally. 
but she didn't marry, if that's, if that's what you mean. She did not marry. Uh, but she's suggesting that the marriage that she has, as time goes on, right, right down, especially at the time of the Spanish Armada in 1588, when, when Philip II attacks England, at that time, she's not just the Virgin Queen, she is married, all right, but her, her, she is married to the nation. That's her sacrifice. And it's, it's, a, it's a nationalism that's tied to her virginity. It's, kind of, it, it's a twist on words. So as you read through uh, Christopher High's book on Elizabeth, uh, you kind of get a picture, as I told you before, someone who's very manipulated and so forth. I'd like, it, I'd like one, of the, one of the questions is definitely going to be, compare his point of view with the traditional point of view that she was really a great queen. Uh, and what's his take on, on her power? Uh, it's, 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 kind of, it's a series that came out a couple of years ago called Profiles in Power, How People Manage Power, How People... You know, power is a magic word in, in, <coughs> in history for the last 10 years, or more, maybe 20 years. Uh, power. It's not sex, it's power. Everything's power, power, power. And you, after a while, you just vomit. You're reading this, this power, this, everybody's into power in the history. Um, and so this is, this is a series that covers the same thing, dealing with, dealing with Elizabeth, how she manipulated men, and how she made it all twisted all up and got it to work somehow. Uh, not really a super person, but just a, a super slick politician. My guess is that it's an acceptable thesis, but at the same time, is it real? Is it real? Okay, now, she's on the throne. She's got this compromise out there. Most Englishmen are happy with this. If I asked you, you know, discuss attitudes, how, how are English Catholics, where do they go wrong during this period? They go wrong when they began to support Mary, Queen of Scots, for Queen of England. They're supporting the Catholic cause. Who is paying to support the Catholic cause? Who is, who is out there raising money and shipping it off to England in order to support this sort of sabotaging of Elizabeth? Philip II. Yeah. Felipe II. Uh, yes. Question, who would rule Scotland and marry out of the way? You had her son being appointed, uh, James the Sixth. He's just, he's very, <coughs> he's, 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 he's got a regency, meaning that he's got adults over him that are handling the affairs of state. The question of Scotland is really weird at this time because you have a Protestant majority in the South and a Catholic majority in the Northern Highlands. They don't get along particularly. And they, have, they kind of do and don't. Uh, it's, it's just a different culture. Uh, you might as well say there are two Scotlands. So the other question is in Scotland when you You've got his, these two groups. Uh, in the lowlands, where the majority of political power is held, because you've got the bigger cities like Edinburgh, uh, who is really calling the shots? There is the, there is the uh, Scottish Parliament that's been there for quite a while. It goes back to the time, a little, <coughs> at least beyond earlier than William Wallace and Braveheart and all that stuff, the Parliament's been around. But you also have something else in the South that challenges that control, and another, that other issue is the Church of Scotland, and it's called the Kirk, K-A-R-K, the Kirk uh, Presbyterian Church, but it's general, the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church was more powerful than the Scottish Parliament. And they really couldn't stand Mary, Queen of Scots. So it looks like the Highlanders kind of pick up her cause a bit when she's in England. And 
sort of become a tool to, to try and bring her back to the forefront of Scottish politics to get her back. By this time, James is a little boy. He's under a regency. Uh, he's not really ruling. I mean, he, he reigns, but he doesn't rule. Um, but he's he is the one that's he's, he's the figurehead for sure. He will eventually become James the Sixth of Scotland as James the First of England in 1603. What nobody can possibly believe is that Mary, the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, is actually become, going to become the next ruler of England. Why? Because Elizabeth has no children. Okay. But she is building this very strong nation. One thing about England under her rule, there is there's there are no there is no great religious foment. There's no civil war. There's no arming one part of the country against another part of the country. And the reason that's true goes back to Henry VII when he disarmed all of the feudal nobility. And he got rid of their private armies. Had private armies still been in England at the time of Elizabeth, I think all hell would have broken broke him loose. Yeah. It's supported between Mary and, and Elizabeth and all that stuff. <coughs> a lot of stuff would have gone on. But I think uh, Henry VII did it. It was a very wise move. It's the first one to ever do it. And the English managed to work out their, their issues a lot. But her compromise, to me, is, it was, it's, a, it's brilliant. It's just absolutely brilliant. It is the wave of the future. Religious toleration <coughs> is what the future holds. <coughs> Intoleration, one law, one faith, one king, which was the typical stand on the continent, uh, <coughs> bodes ill for the future of, of what's going to happen on the continent which is 150 years of religious, horrible religious wars. England's finally going to break down on that issue in the 17th century uh, with the Stuarts. We're going to have a religious war. The Puritans versus the Cavaliers, uh, the, the Great Civil War. And it's on the issue of religion as, as much as everything. Okay. But it's only after Elizabeth's gone. And the Stuarts are, are the, probably the dumbest group that ever ruled England. They never learned anything, right? Right. It's probably a frickin' Stuart. <laughs> no. But the Stuarts are very strange. They never seem to learn anything. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, <coughs> how does this contrast with what's going on in the continent? We talked about that a little bit last time. See if you remember. <clears throat> Who's persecuting who on the continent right now? Everybody persecuting everybody. Everybody is. Uh, okay. French monarch is after who? Huguenots. French Huguenots on the coast. They're Calvinists. <coughs> they, they are masters of merchant shipping, making money. All that good stuff. Many of them are bankers. They're part of the wave of the, of the future, for good or for good or for bad. Civil war breaks out in France in 1555, and it's going to be it's runs for 20 something years. At the end of the day, uh, he slaughters the his Huguenot subjects on. It's called the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre of 1571. A huge slaughter of French Huguenots in the city of Paris. <coughs> in Spain, Philip II does two things. He attacks his Dutch subjects in the Spanish Netherlands because they have become Calvinists. He leads a major military expedition against them, 100,000 man army. The Dutch go on the counterattack. They flood the dikes. They drown a lot of his troops. A lot of this goes on. Philip's going to lose probably close to 100,000 men in Spain over the next few years. And then the Dutch East India Company, which is formed out of the Calvinists living in the Netherlands, are going to attack almost every Spanish possession overseas. They build ships. They are, become the master shipbuilders of the, of the late 1500s, <coughs> early 1600s. 
Dutch built the best ships going. They were the masters of the application of firepower to ocean-going ships, and they blew the Spanish ships out literally out of the water. They also attacked the Portuguese. Why? What gave them the, the leverage to do that? Because Spain had, in all of its wisdom, Philip II had seized Portugal. And when he seized Portugal, he also acquired all of Portugal's overseas colonies. How much, how much of that is there over there? How much in the way of colonial expansion had Portugal gone through? You name it, they were everywhere. And they made a lot of money with it. African coast, slave trade, gold trade, ivory trade. Sugar trade on the plantation islands that they discovered. <coughs> trade in Brazil, which they accidentally ran into. Trade around the Cape of Bona Esperanza, the Cape of Good Hope. Into India, they built a huge city of Goa. Uh, became known as Golden Goa. Probably had close to 100,000 inhabitants at one time. Portuguese settlers going there, interburied with the native population, uh, and try to expand Catholicism in India. And so now the Dutch are going to attack Golden Goa. They're going to attack the island of Ceylon, today known as Sri Lanka, because Ceylon is, it became a Portuguese island. And the king of Portugal was the head of the Buddhist church, the Buddhist church, believe it or not, in Sri Lanka. Uh, then come the Dutch. The Dutch take over Sri Lanka and try to build and make everybody Dutch reformed. First they're Buddhists, then they're Catholics, now they're Dutch reformed. They don't even know what the hell they're doing. <laughs> they don't understand what is going on. And there is no such thing as a Dutch king. There is no king of Holland. So it's the, it's the stat holder, the state holder of Holland that becomes the, the, the ruler of Sri Lanka or Ceylon. It's really bizarre. It's the Portuguese that built up the capital at Colombo, capital of Ceylon. I'll just, just keep calling it Sri Lanka. So they changed names a while back. It's like when Burma became Myanmar. Nobody could find Myanmar on the map. You still can't. It's almost it's changed again. Okay, now. Um, so Sri Lanka, and then you go to the Indonesian islands. The Portuguese were in the Indonesian islands. They were in uh, first in the area of Jakarta, the Spice Islands. They made a fortune in the Spice Islands. They built a number of fortifications. <coughs> Their little fleet was in there. And then they moved on into the China trade at Canton. Only country allowed to have trade with China were the Portuguese at Canton, up the river. It's an island. And then across the Sea of Japan at Nagasaki. It's the first European presence in, in Japan, was the Portuguese at Nagasaki. They reinforced all this with the coming of their uh, the clergy. Because the clergy now come as a as a way of backup to do what? To convert the native population to Catholicism. Not just any Catholicism, it's Portuguese Catholicism. And a loyalty to the King of Portugal, John I and John II, kings of Portugal at this time. Uh, so in 1580, Philip II declared war on Portugal next door won the war, because he's four times bigger, and absorbed all the Portuguese colonies, which now make all the Portuguese colonies. It's open season on Portugal's colonies, because the Dutch are at war with Spain. Spain has acquired Portugal, acquired all her colonies. That makes the, the Dutch now become what? Frickin' jaws <laughs> of the globe. They're everywhere gobbling up all these Portuguese colonies. So you find this reason the Dutch come behind the Portuguese, First, down the African coast, number one. Secondly, in, on, in South Africa, Cape Town. Dutch now form a uh, control of that. That's how the Dutch get involved in South Africa. Then they move uh, into the west coast of India, near Goa. They're not as successful as this, because the Mughal Empire does not trust uh, the Dutch. They don't trust the Portuguese. They don't touch, trust the Dutch. <coughs> they'll later they'll deal with the English a little bit, but they're very hesitant to do it. So mostly the Dutch presence is going to be in, in southern India and in the on the island of Sri Lanka. 
creating the Dutch Reformed Church. Then they'll move into Indonesia. And at the capital, Indonesia's capital in Jakarta, which are known as the Spice Islands, the Dutch will set up their own capital within the framework of the Dutch East India Company because this is a Protestant country with a Protestant <coughs> company ethic. It's not, this is like a company at war. It's not just a country at war, it's a company at war. And so the Dutch East India Company, also known as the VOC, is the Dutch letters for the, the overseas company, establishes its headquarters at Jakarta, but they change the name to Batavia, B-A-T-A-V-I-A. -A -A. Now what is that about? It's the ancient Roman name for Holland, Batavia. And so they're reverting back to the old Roman titles, and they create this, this incredibly powerful company with headquarters at Batavia, in Indian, <coughs> which is Jakarta. And they're going to set up a monopoly to control the Spice Islands. Yes. So you said there's no Dutch king, there's just the state. Stadholder. Does he have complete control of the military like other pretty, monarchs? Pretty, the time? Uh, or is the company called the it's, it's the, mostly the company. So who's in charge of that? Seven okay. cities with seven, with seven man board of directors which forms what's known as the Dutch East India Company. They're really tough, they're very powerful, and they're, they're out to huge, I mean, you think the Koch brothers are out for a profit. <clears throat> These guys are really out for a total, not just a profit, but a total monopoly. Of them. And so they build, uh, they're gonna start building a lot of their ships over there as well uh, to protect their monopoly. They develop a military force in Indonesia to protect their monopoly, uh, and since they own their own ships, they don't really balance what's going on. They don't really keep a tally on, on repairs of certain things because it's all done in the, by the company. Nonetheless, they're at war, but they have, they have managed to grow all over the place because they're at war with the Spanish who absorbed the Portuguese and have taken all, over, all these Portuguese and Spanish colonies all, all over the place. <laughs> they, they, then they attacked the Philippines. Didn't work. That didn't last long. It's, it's a bridge too far. Uh, they'll then go after the China trade, and they'll go after the, the, the trade in Nagasaki, Japan. The result is in both cases there, they're going to create such confusion and such fear on the part of the Chinese and the Japanese as to what these people are doing here, and why in the hell are they in conflict all the time? Because it's Catholic versus Protestant overseas. And as these conflicts grow, China and Japan both say, let's get rid of these guys. Just get them out of here. So the response is huge. China makes a move to try and get rid of them. They limit them to the coast. That's all the best they can do. Japan does get rid of them during the period of the Tokugawa Shogun, 1650, uh, right on through um, 1850. They're gone. Those that don't go are executed tortured to death, and so forth. And especially, the, the toughest ones of the, of the Portuguese, being uh, the Jesuits, missionaries, uh, died by the thousands in China and Japan, but mostly in Japan. The Dutch were driven out of Japan and placed on a small little island where they could behave themselves and don't get in trouble. It's a little island called Dashima, D-A-S-H-I-M-A, -A, and there they stayed to trade. And that was the only enclave left of the Dutch East India Company in this huge, what had been huge, lucrative trade with Japan. They also maintained a small enclave near Canton, <coughs> where the Portuguese maintained a small enclave uh, at Macau. It was one of the last colonies uh, to um, actually be absorbed by the, by the PRC, People's Republic, uh, just a few years ago. Okay, now, so the Dutch East India Company is a very slam-bang, slam-dunk company. They're huge. They're aggressive. Philip II regretted that he ever made war on his Dutch subjects because of this. But this is what this is all about. This is the age of religious wars. Finally, uh, in Spain itself, he makes war on his own subjects 
uh, as we mentioned before, going after groups that he called, you know, these are these are secretly Jews, these are secretly Muslims, these are secretly Protestants. And so many of these groups get out of the area after the persecution starts, it's, it's, they and they send the persecution into the New World, into Mexico, into Peru. Uh, it's the, forget the, uh, forget the title of it. That's, it'll come back. Anyway, but the persecution of the Inquisition taken to the New World uh, <coughs> creates just dastardly conditions in, of mistrust of the New World. So their, their colonies began to really, really uh, suffer from the use of the Inquisition. In Spain itself, uh, it's notorious. The Inquisition kills thousands. So while the Spanish were in Mexico condemning the Aztecs for human sacrifice, they themselves were committing tons of human sacrifice based on what? Based on religion and greed and everything else with the Inquisition. So the question is why you, I mean, you can condemn human sacrifice, which, which was, I think, obviously should, but at the same time, look at the Inquisition. <coughs> that was about as cruel as you can get. The, at least the, the Aztecs were focused why they were doing it. <coughs> But the Catholic Inquisition was always twofold. You had a religious motive, but you used the religious motive to seize land <coughs> because of your own private greed. And this, this was going terribly, terribly wrong. All right. Now, what are the English doing with all of this going on? It's all playing around them. They're still looking for the Northwest Passage. And then you had a writer come along during the Elizabethan period. His name was Richard Hakluyt. H H A Y K L U T. It's an odd name. I've seen it spelled a couple different ways, but Richard Hakluyt. And he wrote a work called Effective Occupation. It's a challenge. Effective occupation. It's a challenge in the face of Spain and Portugal to claim the world between them. Now remember when that claim was recognized? It was recognized by a Pope, Pope Adrian. It's called the Treaty of Tordesillas. T O R D I. Let me write this down so I can spell it. T O R D A S I L L A S. 1499. He divided the world between Spain and Portugal. Pope Adrian the Fourth. Why not include everybody else? Because everybody else is not at sea at this time. These are the two that are at sea. The Portuguese have gone eastward around Africa to India and the Indies, China, Japan. Span Spanish have gone west across the Atlantic, seizing the Americas, claiming the Americas, the Caribbean islands, and anything, anything continually to the west. So he drew the line right in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, that's the line of Tordesillas, separating Spanish from Portuguese control. There were no Protestants yet. Martin Luther was already born, but the Protestant Reformation challenge doesn't start until 1520. So these claims are pretty firm by this time. And then it comes by the middle of the reign of Elizabeth, which is at least 60 years after the Treaty of Tordesillas, Elizabeth comes, this writer comes along, who is a, he's a geographer, and a philosopher, colonial philosopher, he thinks the English need to establish colonies overseas. And so he wrote this treatise on effective occupation. <coughs> and he says, Spain and Portugal have no right to claim all the territory where the, just because they land on an island, they can't claim the entire continent. Or because you're on a, you know, you, you, you walk into Mexico, doesn't mean you have a claim to Florida, Texas, 
the whole East Coast, I mean, everything. You establish a small colony in St. Augustine, Florida, does not mean you have the right to claim the entire North American continent, all the way up to Alaska, because nobody knows what's there. You have to be there to effectively <coughs> occupy it. You can't just make a claim based on the fact that of Adrian IV's division of the Treaty of Tordesillas. So what he's saying is, you claim it, you better protect it, baby, because we're coming. I mean, that's the challenge. Effective occupation is a very, very, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's straight talk. It's also, I think, um, makes sense. The English are now building their own merchant navy, their own merchant, armed merchant fleet. They're challenging the Spanish, they're challenging the Portuguese, and they're going to be challenging the Dutch. Now, they've been supporting the Dutch, right? The Dutch are Protestant partners, but they're not the same kind of people. They're not... Their Protestantism is different. You may not think that, but they, they work very different. Yes? What year is effective occupation? Of 1499. Oh, effective occupation about 1560. And so Hacculet's writings really take off. I mean, everybody said, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. Now, so the tension begins to grow between England's, England's support of the Dutch, gave them money, gave them naval support against, against Philip II. They challenged Spanish rule in the Caribbean and the New World with effective occupation, <coughs> the doctrine of effective occupation. And then during Elizabeth's reign from about, from about 15, 1570 on, you have the origin, the beginnings of a real, I'd say, very, very effective uh, affront to the Spanish, and that is the beginnings of the Elizabethan Sea Dogs, the guys that go on the hunt going after the Spanish ships, treasure ships. Uh, this is a merchant war declared by Elizabeth <coughs> using letters of mark. Letters of mark are like a letter, uh, basically you're going to become a privateer. Your merchant ship is going to be armed with possibly 20 guns. You're going to sail across the Atlantic, head for the Caribbean. You're going to attack the Spanish main steal all the frickin' gold and silver you possibly can. This is an undeclared war between England and Spain. Why? Because Philip keeps doing his thing. Which is what? Instigating plots against Elizabeth using Mary as the tool to instigate the plots. <coughs> so now, let me ask you, is any, is, are you clear on all this stuff that's going on at the same time? I mean, a lot of stuff is going on here. And I think possibly the challenge is to sort it out and get it into a thematic uh, exposition on a blue book. <laughs> Very funny. Yes? I have a question. Uh, this, is, this is jumping a little forward, but when Philip sends the Spanish Armada, do the Dutch come and help the English with their navy at all? No, the Dutch are defending themselves. The Spanish Armada is meant, first of all, to go after the Dutch, to destroy an independent Dutch Republic. Go after them, destroy their army, launch an invasion. Uh, the Dutch East India Company ships, very few are there. Most of them are operating out of Indonesia. So they're not there to defend the country. Uh, England will send some ships, but this is Philip II. Philip II has this grand view he can knock everybody out at the same time. <coughs> okay. Come back with us in a minute. So, with Elizabeth, she says, "I've got nothing to lose here. Why not go for this? Go for the Spanish Main. Why not go for, go for attack the Caribbean?" And a perfect example of this: she had two guys, uh, John Hawkins, was a privateer. Uh, 
Walter Raleigh had been a privateer. There are a couple of big ones out there. Um, I'm trying to think of the one, the one big one. The biggest one, probably, was Sir Francis Drake. 1571. Francis Drake on the, his ship, the Golden Hind, which is about a 70-foot ship, not that big, had 20 cannons on it, 10 on each side. He sailed across the Atlantic down into the Caribbean and landed at, on the coast of Panama, a very jungle, a lot of jungle. He disembarked and he laid in wait for the Spanish treasure train. I wish I had a map on that one. I'm sorry. I so if you take okay, here's the East Coast, Florida, Panama. Then you come out of Latin America. Yeah, it's real thin in here by Panama. Right here, <coughs> the Spanish already had operating a ship coming across the Pacific called the Manila Galleon. Has anybody ever heard of it? It traveled, it sailed once a year, and it came from Manila. It had all of the tons of material from the China trade, the Japan trade. That the, the Spanish were able to trade with the Portuguese and everybody else to bring across the Pacific. And they came down here to cross at this juncture. You also had treasure ships coming from the old Inca civilization from Peru brought up here as well. There's several ways they did this, but this was one of the routes that was well known. They crossed the Isthmus of Panama on land to unload on other Spanish, to load on other Spanish ships, that ship would continue across to Seville, Spain, bringing you just a year's supply of treasure, massive treasure. So they're bringing all this material, silks, teakwood, uh, mother of pearl, all kinds of inlay, and, 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 and tons of spices from Indonesia, all this stuff coming across on the Manila Galleon once a year. They unload here, they disembark, and then they reload here again. It's called the Manila Galleon or the Seville Trade, S-E-V-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Sir Francis Drake, 18, 1571, was laying in wait right here. Got a couple hundred guys on a ship, and uh, they attacked this mule train coming across. They got all of it. Took all the bullion, all the gold, all the silver bullion, put it on the Golden Hind, and then took off this direction here. He's off and running when the Spanish are in hot pursuit. They didn't catch him. Goes around the tip of South America. He goes through the Straits of Magellan. That's only the second time it's been done. Who was the first time to have it done? Was Magellan himself. Lucky he got through. Lucky that Drake got through. He got through here. And he hit it, he saw another Spanish ship out here, he attacked it. <laughs> Sank the ship, was going to take it in tow, but said, nah, we were too far away. So he took all the gold, and he took everything off of it. He's now got a frickin' fortune on board. Sank this ship, and he sailed north, and he claimed San Francisco Bay. <laughs> in, the name, in the name of Elizabeth. <coughs> Obviously, the Spanish didn't buy it, so they continued to call it. <coughs> St. Francis Bay, San Francisco Bay, okay. So then he sailed across, took another Spanish ship on the way, and then moved through the Philippines, in through Indonesia, all the way around the Cape of Good Hope, finally all the way up the West African coast, all the way to England, and he got to England uh, in 73, two-year two -year trip, 
that he had brought back enough money to pay for the operation of the English court and everything they did, the whole country, for the next couple of years. They paid for everything, all the stuff he brought back. Uh, Philip II condemned him, of course, and Elizabeth knighted him <laughs> on, the, on the ship. Uh, it's just a great, great routine there. So he's knighted on the ship, and uh, they love this guy, and they keep doing this kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. So then when, like, pirating starts, is that when these guys start attacking English ships as well as Spanish ships, and they just call it something else? Uh, you've got a lot of that going on. The privateers... It's stereotypical Caribbean pirates. Yeah, they're, you're going to have more of that a little later on. Not as much in the 16th century. 16th century is still pretty much tied to the national question. Spain, Portugal versus England and versus the Dutch. Uh, there are obviously some individual pirate ships around. But pirating has a different, it, it kind of comes out of privateering. You know, it comes from the privateering tradition, but at the same time, it's, 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 it's different. Right. Right. You don't have a national support system for it. Uh, you do for the privateering. Privateering are basically uh, armed merchantmen operating on behalf of the king or the queen of the country of origin, which is legal. It's considered legal. Not pirating, but, but privateering. Uh, well, this this thing, this is this is just a great heroic effort. It's not a part of this. Drake. And others were doing the same thing. It finally pushed uh, further attempts on the part of Philip II to inspire Catholic revolts in England to overthrow Elizabeth and get Mary, Queen of Scots, on the throne. <clears throat> it, it was probably, I mean, it was what it was kind of. It was probably a dumb move on his part. Uh, but he, but but you looking at, I mean, actually, he moved on this very slow. Uh, Philip may have thought a lot about overthrowing Elizabeth, but he didn't do much about it, actually, except for you trying to use Mary in a few plots here and there. There wasn't any major rebellion occurring in the country. He didn't try to stir up an army to throw it at her. Uh, he took his time with this thing. He's called, Philip II is called the Prudent King. The Prudent King, that's his nickname. Uh, he's, uh, he, all, he also has a big issue that if he doesn't watch, <coughs> doesn't watch himself, uh, he could be in continual war with another another ma major force in the Mediterranean, and that's the Ottoman Empire. So he's got to watch that. And in the 1570s, <coughs> while he's flirting with a war with England, he doesn't do it. But he's got he's got that the tension going with Elizabeth. He gets himself in a major fracas with the Ottoman Empire in the Eastern Mediterranean over the seizure of the island of Rhodes, R-H-O-D-E-S. Uh, Rhodes is manned, it's operated by the, the, Knights of Ro the Knights of the Island of Rhodes. It's a medieval order. And uh, they're tough, they're hanging on. But eventually the Ottomans take the island extend their power, and so now Philip believes he must extend his power into the Eastern Mediterranean and him in the Ottoman Empire. So he's at war with two different, on two different scores here. The Muslim Ottomans in the Eastern Mediterranean who have moved their territory all the way west to Gibraltar which is not in the Eastern Mediterranean, it's in the total west, right next to, it's right across from Spain, so they're a threat. And then uh, he's gonna take them on in a ma major uh, maritime collision. The Ottoman Navy has been attacking Spanish ships in the Mediterranean. The Spanish have been attacking Ottoman ships in the Mediterranean. And so of the Battle of Lepanto, L-E-P-A-N-T-O, in the 1570s, it's a huge battle. It involves close to 400 ships. These are ships that are with oars. They have sails, 
when they are under four power. Uh, possibly something <coughs> like 400 oarsmen on each ship. It's a huge, huge, huge battle. It's Lepanto, L-E-P-A-N-T-O. After a number of days of battling <coughs> in the Aegean, the Spanish win the battle. It's, it's, it's just headline freaking news. They have beaten their historic enemy, the Ottomans. Now the Ottomans are going to rebuild their navy and come right back. Have you ever thought about how many trees we're depleting here? Now, Europe is already almost depleted by this time, especially southeastern Europe. This is where the Ottomans are taking trees, but so are the Habsburgs. And the Spanish. There's virtually no trees left in Spain. Have anybody been to Spain? Pretty treeless, a lot of it. Yeah. Okay. So they go out to meet the Ottomans, Battle of Lepanto. It's a glorious victory. It's the biggest thing going, but it's basically what this is tactically. It's an ocean-going land battle. What do I mean by that? Ocean-going land battle. Both the Ottomans and the Spanish have guns on the front and in the rear, fore and aft. But no guns on the side because nobody really knows how to do that without sinking their ships. The Spanish have managed to survive, oddly enough, using Mediterranean-style warfare, not the Atlantic-style warfare, which the Dutch and the English are developing. And even the Portuguese developed to some degree. The Spanish are content as long as we can, can win it, we'll win it. We don't have to change directions. Now, they, they knew how to use artillery. They had converted some of their ships. They had to. They were operating out of the Atlantic. But when it came to fighting this battle, they reverted to the Mediterranean style, which is you ram the enemy ship <coughs> with what? Oars. It's like freaking Ben Hur. <laughs> and you're ramming your ship. Just turn it, you know, a little port side or starboard side. Aim a gun over there. Aim a row gun. No, we can't do that. They don't trust the technology. They're not that good at it. So no wonder Sir Francis Drake was able to knock the crap out of him going over there. Because they just didn't, they couldn't adjust. They never adjusted. You talk about the great Spanish galleons. And they had lots of guns, a port and starboard side, but they weren't very effective at using them. <coughs> so that they win Lepanto, and that's what counts. We won at Lepanto. Some years later, one of the great Spanish writers, uh, Cervantes, who wrote uh, Don Quixote, was giving speeches. You know, he's on a book sales tour. <laughs> By Don Quixote. He showed up at Bloomsbury, you know, book tour, Ashley, Ashley. And he's down there doing his thing, you know. And people would ask him questions about the book. And he, he, he'd always, he'd, he'd just love to pull this one. Yeah. Raise his arm, no hand. I fought at Levante. I fought at Levante. He was more proud of losing his hand at the Battle of Levanto than anything he'd ever written. And he celebrates, he's like he go to the, you know, he's going to the, uh, the VA, and he's celebrating. He's, he's, this is fl freaking Flag Day, Spanish Flag Day, Philip, Viva Philip II. You know, we, beat, we won in Lepanto. That's, that was so big for the Spanish morale. So guess what? King of Spain says, okay, it's now, now, now this is where he makes a big mistake. You beating the Turks at Lepanto, is not going to solve all your problems. That's one problem if you use one kind of tactical ability to do it. What goes wrong with the Spanish Armada in 1588? They think it's going to be Lepanto number two. But they're going to fight, they're going to move into the English Channel. They're not going into the Mediterranean again. They're not going to fight the Turks, they're going to fight the English. 
but they're going to do more than fight the English. That this is a big knockout blow for the Catholic for the Catholic world. Yeah. What year is this? This is now 1587. He makes a decision. He, he doesn't do it until 1588. But he waits until the, the death, the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots in England. He uses that as the excuse for attacking England. Elizabeth has committed a crime. She's executed the, the, the duly God-appointed queen, the church-appointed queen of England. She's executed her. <coughs> and she, as an illegitimate, is now faced with my wrath. So with 130 ships, he decides on a knockout punch. It's already, it's summer, it's a great, if you're gonna do it, do it now. Don't wait till fall or winter. Three, 130 ships, first thing he's gonna do is knock out the Dutch Republic. Take those guys, take on those little Calvinist bastards. Let's get rid of them now. So he goes after them. War, he's launched, he's got unloaded troops. He's also brought troops all the way up from the central Italian peninsula. It's called the Spanish March up the Italian peninsula. Tons of what? Because Spain controls Italy. So you've got a large Catholic army coming up into the Netherlands, vis-a-vis -vis going through Italy and the and eventually part of France and the Low Countries to get to, get to the Netherlands. Secondly, he's used the arma his armada in support of the French king to exterminate the French Huguenot presence on the coast of France. So it's all right together. So he's attacking the French Huguenots right along here. Spain, all on the side, all through this area. He's going after him in support of the French monarch. He launches attacks into the Netherlands, has brought a major army up from, from Italy into the Netherlands. This is a coordinated double attack here. And then when he's finished with this, actually these two down, he wants to take all these troops, 130,000 troops, I'm sorry, 100,000 troops, put them on barges and accompany them along with the 130 ships across the English Channel to go up the Thames Estuary and land them outside of London. I mean, the thing sounds pretty bizarre. It is bizarre. If you're thinking this is, this is ambitious, it really is ambitious. It's, it's, it's really the beginning of the end of the Spanish Empire. That's how ambitious it was. So, makes that move, heads up. In a three-day battle, 15, summer of 1588, I have to go back and find the date. But it's obvious that he's got superior numbers. The crescent formation is a crescent that goes into the English fleet like this surrounding. <coughs> the idea is to catch the English fleet so it can't get away, you trap it, and then you begin to simply do the same thing that you did in the Mediterranean. You get close enough to English ships. You don't, you don't hit them with artillery. You hit them with grappling hooks to draw them close to you so that you can have your ocean-going land battle, all, all your land troops on board your barges and on board your ships, to land on the English ships, kill everybody, take the ship captive, take it with you, uh, easy to easy said than done. He goes to do it, and then the English don't cooperate. Well, they never do. So the English now turn on the Spanish using faster moving ships with artillery, and starting to blow the, the Spanish Armada out of the water. The Spanish can't respond. The ships are bigger, they're heavier, and they're and they're waiting to you throw a grappling hook. While you're throwing a cannonball. <laughs> so it didn't, it didn't work too well. So he goes back to Holland, sails back to Holland, okay, I gotta we gotta we gotta rethink this. 
And while they're at, at anchor off the coast of Holland, here come enemy fire ships. The English have set on blaze some 10 ships, older ships, caught in the current and the wind to blow into the Spanish. All the Spanish ships are chained together. <laughs> so here comes the fire ships. You can't unchain these guys quite enough. The fire ships hit one section of the fleet. It begins to expand. All everybody is, I mean, it's the worst thing on a wooden ship is a fire. And the wind is blowing like hell, and just, man, it's just, everything's going up in flames. And he's looking for a getaway out. He's got, got to get out of this. Now, actually, I'm talking about like Philip, because, but Philip wasn't there. He's going to get notes on this every day from his commander. The ships are on fire. They now cut loose. They separate from each other. They go back into the, into the English Channel, sailing. And here comes a three-day storm. I mean, a big storm. It blows them all over the place, and ultimately, uh, as they begin to get blown up to the north on the channel, as they go move north, half this navy is going to go all the way around the British Isles, all the way around the tip of Scotland and the Outer Islands, and wind up in the Atlantic, come down the Atlantic, and they're trying to think, you know, where in the hell are we? The storm stops. He's got, he's got half his ships left. They finally make it back to Spain. By the time they make it back, they have less than half those ships left. They're in tatters. It's a total disaster. Philip is told about it. He goes to his private chapel. And he plots his next move. I mean, he it's a very funny thing. He'll spend as much time on building a bridge in Spain as he will on the time to figure out what went wrong with the Armada. I mean, his, his biographers say he's just, he's a, he is a typical bureaucrat. There's no emotion with this, he just, next move. <coughs> Meanwhile, on the coast, observing much of this battle was Elizabeth. She shows up. With sword in hand. Well, she's going she's gonna to lead the charge. Well, she's not going to lead the charge, but she's there. That's the important thing. And she tells her people, I'm here. You know, I, I may be in the frail body of a woman, but I have the heart of a man, you know, and the heart of a king, and a king of England, too, which means that you're double fucking tough, you know, and we're facing you off. We're going to clean your cage. And everybody's going, fuck it. I mean, they're all out there. They're all out there cheering. This is, why this, is, is this a great queen? Is this Christopher High's total manipulative wimp? No. It's a great queen. So you better answer this question right. I don't know. He's wrong. I don't care the answer. But, but anyway. So let me stop with that.